Okay, um, I'd just uh, like us all to begin now, if that's okay. Thank you very, very much for coming. Um, it's an enormous pleasure for um, the International State Crime Initiative to welcome uh, Nafis Ahmed today. And I want to thank Saab Qasim, who has organised uh, this series enormously because he's doing a fantastic job with the support of Louise and Jess. Thank you very, very much, Saab. Um, Nafiz, um, and we're absolutely delighted to have Nafiz with us, um, and I think we're very lucky to have you with us, given the amount of work you seem to kind of capture within your, your, your daily life. Nafiz is an award-winning journalist uh, whose investigative work encompasses actually most of the world's pressing uh, political problems, the most of the, the, the pressing intellectual and, and political questions of our time. He's editor-in-chief of a new crowd-funded public interest project on investigative journalism. It's called Insurge Intelligence. Uh, he's a columnist at Vice and a weekly columnist for the, uh, the news outlet Middle East Eye. Uh, he's written extensively on the war on terror uh, and his latest book, A User's Guide to the Crisis of Civilization, addresses the interconnections between the war on terror, climate change, economic crisis, militarism, energy and food. So, you know, it's everything. So I think today uh, Nafiz's topic is the crisis of civilization and the systemic causes of mass violence. Uh, and I think Nafiz is in an excellent uh, position to, to, to talk to us about this today. So we're very delighted to welcome you here, Nafiz, to Queen Mary, um, and I'm going to hand over to you right now. Thank you. Nafiz will speak for approximately half, half an hour, 30, 30 minutes or so, and then we'll open up the session for questions and contributions. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me um, for that very kind introduction. Um, so, there's quite a lot captured in that um, title. I don't know if I'm going to be able to talk about all of that, the crisis of the and the systemic causes of mass violence, but I thought the way I would do this is talk about um, what I mean when I talk about the crisis of civilization, and then talk about um, some of my work on the issue and how it's kind of, how it intersects with the idea of violence and the different the kind of reporting that I've done which kind of throws light on the different elements of it and how it all fits together. So, I mean, in terms of like, in terms of this idea of the crisis of civilization, so it's really important to frame the problem that we're dealing with. So, if we look at, look at it, look at it in the context of the title, which is mass violence. And I'm trying to say to you that there's the link between um, a wider civilizational crisis and this phenomenon of mass violence that we see today in the world. So in order for me to substantiate that idea, we'd have to look at very concretely at different cases of mass violence. Um, we won't have time to do that in detail, but what we can do is just start with a broad sweep of some of the things that we see happening simultaneously. On the one hand, generally speaking, I think we can agree that there's been a rise in xenophobia over the last 10 to 20 years Xenophobia in general has been on the rise, and it's happening across Western Europe, the United States, um, <clears throat> it's happening in the UK, and it's been increasingly anti-Muslim in its orientation, but it's certainly not exclusively anti-Muslim. Um, but there's always, I mean, we've always had this kind of, um, there's always been, you know, marginal groups, far-right groups, which have fostered this kind of suspicion of the other, whether it's you know asylum seekers or migrants or um, people of colour, however you want to refer to it, or specifically specific faith groups, and in this case Muslim groups, but I think after 9/11 it took a very Muslim turn, um, and a lot of the same kinds of xenophobia that we have, which may have been very anti-Semitic before, has now it's not it's not that anti-Semitism has gone down. It's actually that now we've had anti-Muslim sentiment added into something that was already existing and, and kind of like changed the direction of it. So that's one, that's one way in which we've seen this kind of increased polarization in society. And in some cases that has manifested in, 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 in sporadic violence. So on the one hand we've seen a rise in 
anti-Muslim attacks. At the same time, we've also seen that there is um, this phenomenon of Islamist terrorism, which has also been um, very persistent. And in some cases, we've had a rise in, in certain types of terrorist attacks by Islamist groups. And we've also seen a decline in other types of terrorist attacks. And that has also come part and parcel with um, what, I th what, it, what I think is this increasing instability which happens to be in certain Muslim majority regions in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, so if we look at what's been happening over the last, and, and this is coincided obviously with um, you know, the, the, this kind of new era of the war, of the war on terror and the, the kind of heightened military interventions that we've had in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, as well as the more indirect kinds of interventionism we've seen, where it's kind of drone strikes and things like that, um, you know, which, which are not so much talked about. If we look at, for example, what's happening in North Africa and Algeria, there is, a, again, there's a big military footprint there. We don't often hear of this as, as a military intervention, um, but there is a form of military interventionism going on. Um, so we've had all of this acceleration. You know, this, there's an acceleration of, of, I say, our military footprint in the sense of the US, the UK, the West. And there's been, an, that's, there's been accompanying with that this, this destabilization in these regions where you've got societies um, facing internal disorder, which in some cases is manifest in what is security agencies would describe as civil unrest, people on the streets protesting, and in other cases it's full-blown insurgencies. Um, and, you know, examples, I think the string of, the arc of instability that we've seen in the wake of military interventions from kind of Libya to Yemen to Syria is, is a really kind of like, I think that encapsulates um, and kind of, you know, we see a real, direct physical concentration of this kind of coinciding factors where we've got lots of military involvement, we've got lots of um, kind of terrorist recruitment, we've got state failure, and all these things happening at the same time. Um, <coughs> so that's kind of like, so that's kind of where we, that's just trying to frame some of what's happening at the moment. So in terms of how um, I look at the issue of trying to understand mass violence, Generally, I think I draw a lot on um, social theories of genocide, which look at the way in which group identities change in the context of social crisis. And in my view, most of the time when we're looking at uh, major cases of mass violence or genocide in history, um, it's usually precipitated by some kind of crisis which fundamentally undermines um, and uh, the kind of the, the prevailing norms and values and identities that people take for granted. And one of the ways in which communities can respond, and it's only one of the ways, it's not like a necessity, but one of the ways in which they can respond is to adopt these exclusionary identities. So in, in the search for kind of security and stability, a sense of kind of, um, a sense of kind of a, uh, identification with people who are close to you. Sometimes you get you get groups which I mean sometimes it's uh, you know, there are psychological theories which look at whether it look at it's the extent to which this might be something which just happens. But I think for the most part you're looking at the politics of it, where you see political actors um, which may have been very marginal before see an opportunity to mobilize on the basis of new identities which are very polarized and to say well this is us and generally, often the identities that they'll focus on are very visible. You know, it's going to be your colour, or it's going to be your tribe, or your ethnicity, or your religion, or something really visible and easy. So it's kind of like, I mean, to put it bluntly, it's like the, thick, the racism is thick. You know, you're not like very clever when you advocate racism. You're, you're doing kind of the really dumb thing, which is, hey, you're white, and you're brown, and oh, we're different. So it's kind of like you take the first sign of difference and you make it you centralise it and you make it a fundamental thing. So I think the crucial thing is to see how and why those processes of exclusionary identities begin to form. And that's where we get to this idea of, of crisis, social crisis and the way in which social crisis drives these kinds of exclusionary identities. And I think that's what's happening now. 
I think that we're, and that's, and this is what, um, this is why I bring in this idea of a crisis of civilization. I think that the reason that we're seeing such a massive rise in social polarization um, is to do with the, prop, the fact that we are facing unprecedented global crises, um, which are directly related to globalization as we know it. They're not just kind of compartmentalized, they're not just kind of one little crisis here, which is often how it's conceptualized. They are, for the first time in human history, global, systemic, and interconnected. And with that, I mean, it's starting to kind of, awareness of this is starting to become more mainstream. I mean, you even have politicians, even someone like David Cameron, would, would be able to acknowledge the, that there is a systemic issue here. But even then, it's very shallow, and there's no real content to that. So, for example, one of the things that you'll see is really common now at a mainstream level, for example, you've got institutions like the World Bank or the World Economic Forum who will acknowledge that you know, there is a nexus of three crises. And it sounds great that they're acknowledging that. You know, you've got climate change, you've got energy, and you've got food. Or they might say climate, energy, and water, the kind of dependence you talk to. So they recognize that there's a nexus. The problem is, is that we're still, they're still looking at these things from a neoliberal framework which takes the existing system as kind of the optimal system, it's the best system, and there are certain overarching ideological assumptions about what is good for the economy, what's good for society, <coughs> that condition the way in which these things are analysed. And I think that prevents us from developing a really holistic and systemic understanding of exactly how these <coughs> things are interconnected. So that's where I try to argue that this idea of a crisis of civilization as a, as a concept, and I kind of use that phrase deliberately in a kind of provocation to the Samuel Huntington type thesis of the clash of civilizations, where you know you've got, which in a way kind of encapsulates the xenophobic thing that we've been talking about, where you have well, there's these big civilizational blocks which are divided for whatever reasons in history, and now they're going to fight, and the fault lines are along blah blah blah. And actually what I would argue is that, that ideology of the class of civilizations is precisely a symptom of the crisis of civilization. It's an ideology which doesn't understand the, sy the systemic causes, doesn't understand the root causes, doesn't understand the structures, and therefore projects onto the other and says it's all about the, the, the them and it's them fighting them. And that's what the problem is. It doesn't look at the structures of relations of production, it doesn't look at even um, how that intersects with different classes and different political organisations, political systems within those class structures, and then and then doesn't look at ideology within that context. <coughs> it kind of looks at ideology as this bubble, you know, as you've got the Chinese communists and you've got the great American capitalists and blah blah blah. So, in terms of what I've been trying to do in trying to, there's two kind of things I've been trying to do as a journalist and academic, is one, flesh out the idea of the crisis of civilization. So, um, I wrote a book called The User's Guide to the Crisis of Civilization, which was, like the, it's the first kind of peer-reviewed social scientific um, kind of analysis which attempts to bring together, within a social science framework, climate, energy, food, the economy, um, terrorism and state militarization within a, and just develop like a preliminary way of looking at how these are actually interconnected. I don't know to what extent I succeeded. I think what I managed to do is at least kind of <coughs> is, 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 is show that there is a lot of literature out there which, which you know, I wasn't doing something entirely new. There were people who have already been saying this, but what I did was maybe bring that together and show that there is actually a literature here which we can draw from across different disciplines. And I think also the other thing that was new though was connecting up these kind of broader issues like climate change with things like terrorism and militarization, but not in the sense of securitization. So what you find within the national security industry or the mainstream international relations kind of theorists, what they'll say is, you know, climate change is a security threat because it's an amplifying factor. You know, you've got your existing problems, then there's climate change, Climate change creates droughts and people start fighting because there's not enough water, blah, blah, blah. Which is not entirely false. <coughs> but what they don't look at is the wider social systemic context, the political system, 
the political economy within which that takes place, which allows and kind of allows that amplification process to take place. So, for example, is it a necessity that climate change creates a drought and people fight? No. There are many cases where climate change will have an effect of creating water scarcity, but communities or societies adapt in different ways. Um, you know, whether it's through community initiatives to have better water management techniques, or whether it's through a neoliberal approach even. But the fact is, is that there are other approaches. It's not, it's not a necessity that, oh, there's going to be a securitization problem here. But what you have is this dynamic. And what I'm concerned about is that what we have at the moment is we've got, within the existing structure, we've got, apart from all the Machiavellian stuff that's always going on, you know, you have vested interests. You do have, um, whether it's big multinational firms or whether it's security agencies um, and people in them who have neoconservative ideologies, um, there are also overarching, we're the good guys ideologies, which looks at all of this and, and says, hey, you know, we have to keep this system going because it's the best thing we've got. And the only way to do that is to protect capitalism keep the market free, um, you know, stop these nefarious people from regulating the economy too much. And we also need to empower the state. And what, um, in order to kind of be prepared to um, respond when these crises hit and when, when all those amplifying factors suddenly undermine security, what are we going to do? So we need a strong military that's capable of intervening in all these different areas. We need to have um, you know, rapid mobile response units. And this is the kind of language that you see in the defense literature. And so what I ended up finding out, looking at all of these kind of defense planning documents, is that over the years, this whole apparatus has built up based on this securitization of global crises, which, is, which because you're asking guys with guns to plan for basically the Arctic melting, their, their solution is guns. I mean, obviously, you're not going to basically stop the Arctic melting by blowing up the Arctic. But if you're going to ask a guy with guns, how are you going to do something about the melting Arctic? Their response is going to be, I've only got guns. <laughs> okay, let me see what I can do with guns. You can't stop the Arctic melting, but what you can do is think about, well, maybe I can maximize power in the case of Russia going into the Arctic in order to exploit opening sea lanes and things like that. So what's happening is that there's an ideological undercurrent there, which is pushed by the structures, where existing systems are saying, well, existing people in these systems are saying, we need to solve these problems. How do we solve these problems? Well, we can't change anything that we're doing, because that's all fine and it's, it's beyond changing. Um, but we can do everything else. So basically, we put more money in the military, we have more planning, more preparation, more contingency planning. But what that creates is obviously this dynamic where purely because of this perception of insecurity, everything becomes a threat. So climate is a threat. Um, and you kind of see this with David Cameron constantly saying everything is a national security threat. Um, you know, Jeremy Corbyn is a national security threat. You know, anything you say about family life is a national security threat. And this is, this is kind of like, I mean, it's, it's not just a coincidence that Cameron is saying that now. Because that's exactly the ideology that, that, that they're kind of like, you know, yeah, I and mean, of course I think there is a certain political capital that, that is being cynically used. But there's also this very real belief that if someone like Corbyn comes into power with his crazed socialist ideas, it's, it's a threat. It's a threat to the security industry. It's a threat to the military. It's a threat to Trident. And we need all of those things to, to protect Britain and keep Britain safe. And, so that's the problem, we're dealing with these ideologies. It's one of the things that I've, a lot of the things, so the things that I've been, what I'll do is give you some examples of uh, some of the kind of um, stories that I've been working on. So one of them is, in terms of the economic crisis and how this links to kind of defense planning, obviously one, I think one of, some of the interesting things I was doing at The Guardian when I was there was um, looking at, you know, in terms of tracking this crisis of civilization, looking at how all of these different crises can intersect and make the economy more vulnerable than mainstream economists think it is. So some of the stories I put out were, um, you know, I interviewed a couple of um, economists who were kind of really, who were, who were a little bit outside the kind of mainstream, but were not 
that much outside the mainstream now. So one guy I interviewed had worked in the Treasury. He, he then had, was working at the New Economics Foundation. Um, and he basically was talking about a lot of these really big systemic problems to do with, that, that I'm sure you're all familiar with, that haven't gone away, to do with the way in which debt has been increasing. And if we look at all of the signs now, all of those signs that we saw before the 2007-2008 crash are all worse. And we've now had these kind of like doom-mongering prophecies from really senior mainstream economists, like a guy, um, there was a guy who wrote an op-ed who's he's affiliated with uh, the Bank for International Settlements. Um, and he made a, I think it was last year, at the end of last year, he made a very worrying kind of forecast, but said basically the economy is, there's going to be another crash. Everything is, is kind of set up to allow that crash to take place. We have the same massive debt mountain We've got the same problem that consumers are finding difficulties paying it back. And we now have an inverse relationship with, whereas before, with 2008, one of the factors that was ignored that I was going on about was the role of oil prices. And that um, oil price spikes played a big role in, in pressuring the economy and triggering the, um, kind of triggering the inflationary rise that led to, helped uh, push forward defaults. And there were some modelling studies that suggested this, which I reported in The Guardian. And um, what's interesting now is that these guys are basically saying, the guys who are warning about this, some of them are saying that we've kind of got, an in, because we've got, we're in this kind of interesting phase where conventional oil production um, is declining, and we're now more dependent on this dirty, more expensive form of shale gas and fracking. Um, but there's so much of it coming out so fast that oil prices are plummeting. But the problem is, is that even though there's loads of oil, there's an oil glut. The oil is not in, 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 there's not a shortage of oil, but there's a shortage of cheap oil in terms of production. So the costs of oil production are still really high. Um, and the, the problem is, is that the market price is still very low. So now you've got this massive problem that's been building up where the big oil majors increasingly are having this problem where they're not selling oil at prices high enough in order to cover their production costs. And they're getting, in, they're getting into more debt, and there's this risk of debt defaults with them as well. And this problem is building up. Um, and now they're having to restructure, you know, and, and um, there's been lots of cases of major companies like Shell and um, pulling out of big investments in, in, for example, the US shale gas um, industry and things like that. Billions of pounds, billions of dollars of investments have been written off over the last few years because of these problems. So we've got a similar kind of crisis, but it's completely, it's kind of different. Um, and we're not sure exactly how it's going to play out, but the risks are there. What's interesting is that even though kind of like the, the government, treasury departments and things, <coughs> wouldn't really acknowledge that this kind of crisis is there, you have military studies which are doing contingency planning for what might happen if a crisis like this kicks off. And there was a really interesting study which I reported on um, from the Ministry of Defence, from their Defence Concepts and Doctrine Centre. So they put out this kind of future forecast thing every four years or so or something. Um, and it's kind of a big picture analysis where they draw on like client, they do like all of these big issues and try and see where it's gonna go. So one of the things they said is that basically the next, from now to 2040, that we're in a long recession. And this is interesting because it completely contradicts what you know, George Osborne would say and what even conventional economists would say, which is that you know, there's gonna be, we're in a recovery right now and, and it's gonna happen and it's gonna take off. We're getting there. Um, at some point, it will, it will, it will, something will get better. Um, but the MOD is saying the opposite. It's saying that no, we're in an, e an era of kind of slow growth. Um, <laughs> And um, we have to basically prepare for the impact of that. And one of the impacts on that, of that is going to be basically increased civil unrest inside the UK um, and an increased risk of protesting. Um, and around the world, there is this talk about the global recession and the, and, the, and the way in which that's going to be exacerbated by all of these crises like climate change and how that's going to impact resource scarcity and food and energy and water scarcity. Um, and, how, and what they do is they, they, they kind of like then transplant this with population growth. And this is where it starts to get, 
this is where it starts to get a bit disturbing. So one of the things that um, they start talking about is how there's going to be this rise in populations in Muslim-majority regions, specifically. And they actually talk about how there's going to be like a 150% rise in population in you know, the Middle East and North Africa, and it's going to create... I mean, and, this, and the thing is, is that they're not, it's not like they're entirely wrong, but it's the framing of it, the assumption of it, which are so disturbing. So what they do is, by following this trajectory, which are, you know, is a very securitized trajectory, what they end up doing is saying, so basically as a result of all of this, these regions of the world are going to go crazy, um, and it's all going to be crazy rapid Muslims. And then what they say is, this is really interesting, in terms of the groups that they said we have to worry about, so obviously Islamic radicals, blah, 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 um, we have to worry about the middle classes uniting. I mean, you couldn't make this stuff up. We have to worry about uh, the middle classes may unite across the world using communications technology. Um, there will be a, you know, we have to be concerned about the rise of Marxist, the resurgence of Marxist ideologies. Now, that's fascinating because, you know, critical theory, social theory, I mean, there's a lot of things you could basically say are loosely linked and inspired by Marxists. And, you know, if you get to that, if you go, if you actually speak to defense servers, they have, don't really understand what Marxist ideology is. Marxist ideology is any social theory which basically is critical of government or power or says capitalism has problems. So that was the way it was all being framed within that kind of mindset. So what we found happening was that, the, you know, I reported all of that and then separate stories that I was working on in which we're trying to look at why it is that what was driving the surveillance apparatus. So we had like, you know, the Snowden story was breaking and all that stuff. And I was trying to look at, you know, can I find stuff within all of these documents that kind of throws a light? I mean, my suspicion was that there must, there must, there must be some motivation here which links this back to the planning that we've got here, what, you know, the, the surveillance and all that. And one of the, one of the links that I found was, um, and I reported this as well in The Guardian, was um, after, Snow, after um, the NSA PRISM story came out, what, uh, and it came out that Snowden was a Booz Allen Hamilton contractor, um, what I, I basically found um, one of the, I think it was a 2011 annual report of Booz Allen Hamilton, which confirmed that they had been running um, US Army war games to look at the risk of um, a major social breakdown due to a natural disaster, a terrorist attack, a pandemic, or you know any kind of major um, crisis that could potentially lead to um, either in, uh, a domestic insurgency, or and that's actually the phraseology that was being used, um, or some kind of collapse of, of kind of infrastructure or something like that. So what I, what was what I was writing about at the time was that. You had the same contractor that was basically running and had all access to a surveillance uh, apparatus and you know, was, was employing um, senior national security agency officials, um, which was also contracted to the army to do war games and planning for domestic crises that could lead you know, to some kind of um, breakdown of existing law and order. And coupled with that, we've seen all kinds of legislation being put through, you know, which has strengthen the, um, the security apparatus, apparatus uh, you know, in the United States and which is targeted not just, um, not just kind of like you know, violence, violent extremists, but is also targeted non-violent activists. And that's the other thread that I think was fascinating for me in terms of my reporting was a lot of the stuff that came out around um, this program called uh, Minerva, the Minerva Research Initiative, which was a Pentagon-founded defense initiative to fund social science research at universities, different American universities primarily, but they fund all sorts of universities. How am I doing for time? <clears throat> I realize halfway through, but I don't have a clock. <laughs> <laughs> so I was relying on you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible. got five minutes. OK, please. good. That's good. <laughs> okay, so so one so one of the things that came out when I of this whole Minerva thing was the type of social science research that they were funding. Um, and just to give you an example, and the reason this came up 
is that there was a big story on this, which you probably remember, about experiments that were being done on Facebook without the consent of Facebook users, where you had um, them feeding in kind of stuff, stuff that was, uh, basically you had the experimenters feeding in stuff and it was Pentagon funded to kind of see what the responses were and how it was shared, blah, 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 to kind of map what they see, what they were calling the, map the social contagion on social media. Um, and there was a big, kind of, this was reported quite widely. Um, you know, it went out on, I think they even, there was a couple of even TV reports on because it was Facebook. But what was interesting is that the guy who ran that program um, was simultaneously contracted to the Pentagon under uh, this Minerva project to do studies of, you know, social media and how social media can, um, you know, galvanize social movements and, and looking at the Arab Spring and things like that and map, you know, social contagions. Um, so I started looking into this, and one of the projects that um, was that, that came that came out in the reporting. I, I did some stuff on this, for the Guardian, and also for Occupy.com. And I've also got a story coming out soon, um, which will come under my own um, crowdfunded project, In Search, um, which focuses on the kind of minority report type implications of it. But basically, what they what one one of these projects are doing is literally creating new ways to mine social media data across the board, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, blah, 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 everything, Flickr, um, to put it all in, 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 a, in an integrated database and to then do semantic analysis. And semantic analysis is basically like you're looking at sentiments, you're looking at uh, trying to understand what people think, feel, their emotions, um, and the more recent stuff that is, that the, the stuff that's kind of, the, that is look, they're looking at funding this year, there's been a research call that was put out earlier this year, um, which hasn't been reported on yet, is looking specifically at trying to understand what you think in order to predict what you might do. Now, obviously, that's not going to be on an individual basis, but specifically for groups. But the minority report implications of it are really worrying. Um, and what was, what was really worrying for me was that they were creating algorithms in order to predict behavior. And those algorithms, when I, I spoke to um, Thomas Drake, um, who's, he was the NSA whistleblower who inspired Edward Snowden to leave. Um, and he said to me, that when I, when I asked him about, I showed him the project and asked him about the algorithms, and he said, these are basically the same types of algorithms that they use for signature drone strikes. Which, where, what they're doing with those drone strikes, you know, you've got targeted drone strikes where they supposedly have a, an identified individual that they're going after. And, and then they've got signature drone strikes. I mean, both are very problematic. Um, but the signature drone strikes are, are when they don't actually have a single identified person who they're targeting. It's like a group of people. Um, and they don't necessarily even know their name. But what they've done is they've collected this metadata from different sources, and including social media. Um, and they've tried to integrate it and with, with stuff that can give them geolocation. So whether it's mobile phone metadata, whether it's satellite data, um, that kind of stuff, which is obviously not on social media, but the security agencies will have access to it. So they're trying to develop ways to integrate this stuff, and it's actually being used now. And they're using it to actually, this kind of methodology is something that they're actually trying to enhance, and it's feeding into how they carry out these kind of attacks um, in terms of drone strikes. And now what they're doing is they're moving towards this, building this ability even further, and we're seeing it trickling down now in unpredictable ways to police agencies. I mean, there was a story recently that was put out the other day um, about how uh, various police agencies in, in state police agencies in, in the US are now using social media, mining social media locally, and using it to try and predict crime and using it to build profiles of people and profiles of criminal activity and things like that. So it's already being used in this haphazard way. So you've got this people, there's a sense of it's being driven. And there's also a sense in which it's got its own momentum. So that's what's happening domestically in terms of state militarization. And obviously, internationally, you've got this kind of increased militarization in terms of what we're doing in Syria, what we're doing in Iraq, what we're doing elsewhere. 
Now, whatever one makes of those interventions in terms of their ethics or their motives or whatever, one of the things that is not being discussed very much in public discourse is the reality that many of these interventions do have a very strong energy interest component. So one of the things that isn't, ha I mean, I did, I broke a story by InSearch that, I mean, it did well on my own site, but it's just, it's not, I expected it to be picked up by someone alternative, and it wasn't picked up, and I don't know why. But the story was that there was, um, I did, I, I found a, a journal, uh, kind of like a subscription journal for the energy industry, which is published by um, a company owned by Bahrain, and it's funded by all the major oil industries. Or all majors like Exxon, Shell, BP, Texaco, blah, blah, blah. And in 2011, um, a guy who worked for a French, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the company, a French company, basically wrote a study um, outlining research that they had done to, to analyze the offshore resources of Syria. And basically said that Syria has. Um, we don't know the exact quantities, we haven't got done enough drilling, but from what we have done, we're looking at very significant potential um, of unconventional uh, oil and gas, which is similar to what we've seen with discovered, confirmed resources in the Mediterranean. So we know in the Eastern Mediterranean that there's about, I think there's about 500 trillion cubic feet or cubic meters, I can't quite remember. Um, it's not a massive amount, but it's a significant amount. And it's significant enough that there are big U.S. Army plans and other and Israel, Israeli plans and Egypt and Turkey and all the other local players all scrambling to try and find a way to get this gas to market, specifically to wean off Europe from dependence on Russian gas. It is one of the sources of that. So it was quite um, interesting to see that this company had put this study out. The same guy who actually wrote that study is I'm finishing off with this. He was he's uh, actually contracted. He was contracted to the British government on um, the North Sea, and the French company is backed by the French government. Yeah, the French government owns shares in the company, and in 2010, 2011, this company had contracts with Assad um, and had done all of this surveying with Assad. And in fact. I found um, a PowerPoint slide that had been prepared for the Syrian Ministry of Petroleum, which said that Shell, which actually had contrast with Assad at that time, up to 2011, um, with just as the, you know, the stuff was kicking off on the ground. And this slide, the slides basically said that Shell had, was, there were negotiations going on with Shell to basically find a way to exploit you know, these big, this kind of bring to this, this untapped potential of serious domestic unconventional resources and find a way to bring it to market. So originally Shell was going to be the main kind of player in doing that, but obviously after the after things kicked off, um, I think that became politically impossible to do. So I mean I don't I'm not wanting to reduce the whole conflict to that. Um, but I, but that the role of energy and the role of that in kind of maintaining this this system, this business as usual trajectory is completely underestimated within mainstream discourse. So I think hopefully that kind of gives an understanding of, of what I mean when I talk about the crisis of civilization and, 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 what, and how we have, you know, when we're talking about looking at systemic causes of mass violence, that just means basically looking at how these broader systems and the crisis within those systems is creating um, is creating the kind of like the, 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 the conditions which are allowing this kind of purely from a structural and ideological perspective creating conditions in which that kind of trajectory of, of, of xenophobic otherization becomes more normal even if there are obviously a, there are actors which may benefit from that and may be pushing it there's also a kind of I think a structural process there as well Great, well oh, thank you very much amount in that talk, but I think the fundamental point is that the, 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 the crisis is a collection of crises that are interconnected structurally and that they drill right down to the very basis of, of the capitalist order. And I think that, you know, I mean, that's a, you, to have the, I mean, I think it's very interesting that as a journalist, to, to be working on a range of different stories 
gives you that sense or that capacity to overview and somehow try to make sense of the disparate strands. And you've done that exceptionally well. So thank you very much. I'm opening up now for questions and contributions. Elspeth. Uh, yes, I, I, it's a very interesting presentation and a very wide-ranging one. Uh, but there's a constant leitmotif around oil, uh, which I think is a, a very relevant consideration. One of the things which I'm hearing in the circles that are talking about energy is the completely unanticipated by the mainstream oil producers drop in the price. And this has pushed whole fracking is now absolutely, uh, everything's being closed, tar sands have been uh, put in the mothballs. Uh, there's a whole lot of oil industry, oil production, which can't survive $30 a barrel. Um, the same problem is occurring across commodities. A um, trade industry expert was saying that it's impossible to talk about um, a circular industry that is the, the, the whole recycling of all the bits um, mm -hmm. in production, when commodity prices have dropped by over 60% in the last three years. And I wonder, I know that much of the work that's gone into your book is before the bottoming out of, uh, of these prices, but I wonder how you would analyze that in the context of the, of the crisis. Yeah, I mean, I think this is something which is really interesting because I think the, it took everybody by surprise. I think the collapse in oil prices took both kind of what you would say kind of the ardent peak oilers and the rest and, and the kind of the kind of the conventional industry, all of them by surprise. There was one exception I would say, which was Colin Campbell, who used to he was a former geologist with uh, BP, and he was one of the first people to kind of really talk about peak oil, but he basically predicted that rather than seeing this inexorable rise in oil prices after peak of conventional oil production, you would see more oil price volatility and fluctuation. And so what we're looking at here is, um, is really this question, what you find with the industry, what the industry will say, will say to you, or generally, and certainly what they've said to me, is look, everything's great because look how much oil there is. There's no, you're not running out of oil, we've got an oil glut. And it's so cheap, look how cheap it is. So you guys were wrong, um, which I think is fair enough. But I think on the I think and so I think there was definitely something for the kind of ardent peak holders they got wrong, and I need to concede that. But the reality is, is that we're looking at two different types of oil here, and we're looking at a new age in terms of the way we deal with fossil fuels. We have ended the age of cheap, easy fossil fuels, in my, in my view. Um, and that's pretty much confirmed whatever way you look at it, because we're looking at the important thing is here is production cost. So what's happened with conventional oil? You know, are we, we don't use conventional oil anymore hardly. Conventional oil production has, has been declining as a matter of fact since about 2005. So as conventional oil has gone down, you know, we've seen this transition towards these, you know, what we might say is more difficult, expensive oil. So shale, uh, tar sands, all the rest of it. Um, now, what's happening here is, as I mentioned before, is that because we've got the contradiction between the production costs, which are quite high, and the price on the market, because what's actually, what happens is, it's, it's literally, it's a geophysical problem, because you have to, because of the nature of, sh of shale gas wells, it's like you go there, you drill, um, it's not like drilling conventional. So you have to drill very fast. Um, within one year, your drill could be exhausted and your production rates would be really high. So what happens is production comes out really fast, quite high, and then tapers off quite quickly, which doesn't happen with the conventional world. So in order for you to keep your machine going, you have to drill like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of wells um, to keep that going. So what's happening is that's what's creating the glut. You've got this massive kind of like everyone's like rushing to drill. Then you've got this glut of oil coming out. There's so much oil then coming out that the prices just go boom, hit rock bottom in terms of the market cost. But your production costs are still quite high. You're still spending a lot of money. 
to set up those fracking drills, to pump all of that water, to do all of that processing and refining and all of that nonsense. Um, and it's still very expensive. And it's not, um, when it comes to kind of making it work in terms of the accounting book, it's not adding up. And that's what people like Jeremy Leggett, for example, who you might have heard of, he's writes of the Guardian a lot, he's an ex-oil guy, he went on to join Greenpeace, and he's really kind of, he's done a lot of work on um, carbon pricing and tracking this whole kind of the link between energy and economy. And he's got a lot of really fascinating insights, and he's been saying this for a while, he's one of the guys who's been saying that the fossil fuel industry cannot survive this new era. Because we're looking at uh, the geophysical problem is that the cheap stuff is not there anymore. And I think what's not been, what we've not been able to predict very well as a society is what that post-cheap fossil fuel world looks like. We didn't get that right. We got that wrong. And we're still trying to grapple with it. And we're still not sure how it's going to go. So some people think once the prices bottom out and they keep bottoming out, there'll come this point when... Um, there'll be such a scarce, there'll be no incentive to keep drilling. And so people, so the oil industry will like collapse and you know, no one will drill. And then prices will start to go up again because the, and, and prices will go up and then prices will go up and up and up because there's so little oil being produced because no one's producing it because there's no profit in it that it will again become profitable in a few years time and then prices will go up again and then drilling will restart. But there are some people who think that that's not possible because once you, once you have such a dramatic kind of collapse of your industries due to this debt mountain collapsing all the rest of it, you're not going to be able to kickstart that industry just because prices go up. Because there's not going to be an incentive to do that. The incentive will be what happened, we have sustainable energy that's going to be much more attractive now. And we're looking at in terms of investment, is it better to invest in this or to invest in solar panels. And people like Jeremy Leggett are saying, well, economically, the cost of solar panels is, is going down, whereas the cost of production of fossil fuels is going up. So I think that's kind of what we're looking at in terms of where we're going. And I think one of the, the positive side of a lot of what I'm saying is that a lot of this I see is a symptom of not just a crisis of civilization, but a transition to really a very different type of world. Where it, is a, it is a post-fossil fuel, post-capitalist world which in, in some form or another is, is inevitable. It's going to happen this century. Well, can we pick up on it a bit? Because of course, uh, your analysis was, uh, kind of Marxist. you're stuck on the level of the mode of production related to production. So can we go on to the identity and uh, social movements and um, social solidarity kind of picture a little bit more? Which I couldn't get anything positive. I couldn't get anything optimistic out of your presentation at the beginning. So I'm going to ask you to try and go some op somewhere optimistic. Okay. And of course, um, it is true that you know the whole issue of social solidarity and identity struggles and all that is very much linked to economic forces. But the whole uh, notion that in the postmodernist era you know, we can build a new cosmopolitan identity which would transcend essential differences and all that um, is all that just bunk. Well, no, I can. Yeah. I, 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 that's a really good question, and I, I don't think it's bunk at all. I think if we look at um, if, you, if we look at the content of social movements that have erupted over the last few years, um, the, you know we see that there is a, a common feature of grassroots social movements is that which have success, and we're not talking about whether where they've gone now. That's a separate thing. But in terms of um, the ideas and the content of those movements when they arose, whether it was the Arab Spring or the Occupy movements, we see that these were transnational cosmopolitan movements. Built, you know, in, in, when we look at the Arab Spring, yes, of course, there were nationalist concerns, there were very local concerns, but they were, there was a transnational and global inspiration. And there was even communication between movements in the, in, you know, in the West and in the East. You know, you had that dy dynamism of basically um, in the Arab Spring activists being inspired by the Occupy activists and, and vice versa, the Occupy activists being inspired by what was going on in the Arab Spring and that's still happening now. Um, so I think this is something that I think is really important to remember and this is something, and I mentioned it in one sentence, which is that when you have the process of a social crisis and then there's a social polarisation, the social polarisation is a choice, it's not a necessity, it's not something which is written into any structure 
or written into any process. It's something that happens due to human agents making choices. And you know, maybe you might be able to try and, 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 and uh, try to predict what's more likely or what's more, what's more unlikely, but I'm not someone who believes in any kind of deterministic thing here. I think that one of the whole important, one of the whole reasons that we find this kind of analysis useful is to be able to empower communities to understand how these processes work in order that they can not just be driven by some of these processes but can begin to drive them. And I think what we see in, when these crises take place is that there is opportunity. The problem right now is that there are lots of actors who have power who are exploiting the <clears throat> eruption of crisis for whatever reasons they want to. And, um, you know, maybe in the short term and looking on the face or, or looking in, you know, in terms of the headlines, you know, it all seems like lots of bad news because you see lots of, that's all you hear in the headlines. But I think um, in terms of where things are going, you know, I don't see this as being something which is, um, you know, some, a kind of a deterministic trajectory of, of doom, you know, where, where you know, we, we see a necessity of, of this descent into anarchy and chaos and this post-apocalyptic nightmare, you know. I don't think that's um, an impossibility. I think that's quite a possibility, given human history. But at the same time, given human history, there are lots of other possibilities. Um, and one of the things that I think is really interesting is how crisis gives us opportunities for transformation. Um, and just to give like some, some I think what was one of the ways I think about this is to look back over the last 10 years and to look at the difference in terms of public discourses, um, say from 10 to 15 years ago. So 10 to 15 years ago, you know, and I think there's still lots of struggles here to be had and maybe things are still changing, especially in the wake of Donald Trump and all the rest of it. But I would say at the time of Occupy, um, you know, we had major kind of ideas which were very, very mainstream. The idea that the Iraq war was wrong, or at the very least fundamentally mistaken, and we didn't have a right to go there, we shouldn't have done it. Number two, the idea that the, the Israel-Palestine conflict, Israel has real responsibility for the occupation. Um, number three, the idea of environmental thinking became way more mainstream. You know, majorities across the board, even now, despite all of the disinformation put out by Exxon and the rest of it, the majority of, of population still believe that the environment is an issue and that climate change is real. Um, and at the same time, you have this massive, overwhelming disillusionment with the banking system and with the political class. So, you know, and those are due to a number of reasons, you know, specific crises and various coming in the House of Lords, this and cash for others, blah, blah, blah. Um, but you had a real disenchantment. Now, I think a lot, of those, a lot of those things are still here now. But, you know, you have, so, so what's interesting is the way different actors play on it. So UKIP, for example, will take some of this and then try and turn it into something else. Now, let's worry about the fifth column as well, and blah, 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 blah. You know, Nigel Farage, who is an ex-banker, We'll talk about how he's against the back. So, so it's interesting. You see how they, the, there is a recognition that there is a real disenchantment going on. People want answers. People want solutions. But they're not finding them within mainstream politics. And they're looking for, and that's what's giving space, I think, in some circuits, for some of the more marginal far-right groups to have some traction. But And, and the other group, the far-left, if you want to call yeah, them. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely, the far left. I mean, so we've got, we've seen, I mean, I think the, like, the Corbyn phenomenon is fascinating because for the, I mean, the, the, the massive resurgence of the left and the response that it's received in the mainstream press has been extraordinary. Extraordinary revealing as well of exactly how much the media is aligned with the existing power structures and with the structures behind government. You know, even though it's supposed to be kind of like the, you know, we're, you know, we're basically holding government to account. I mean, that, you know, for the, the, the you wouldn't expect this. In, in, in Egypt, you might think, okay, this is the media's going to defend Sisi. But here, you have to just what, look at all the mainstream headlines across the board, even the Independent and the Guardian, this chorus of denunciation of the opposition party leader, which I just think, you know what, whatever faults you might think Corbyn has, as a phenomenon, that's so revealing about the state of our press, but it's also revealing about that struggle that is now emerging, that there is this very real struggle that's emerging between 
forces of popular forces of the popular will, which are now trying to say we want to take back control of our party. You know, they're trying to take back control of the Labour Party, and have to some extent done that. And this very extreme reaction that's come from these centres of power to say you're all crazy, evil people, blah blah blah, blah. All, all of you are national security threats, all the rest of it. So I think that there is a massive opportunity, and I think if you, people like Jeremy Lego. I did, I did one story where he set out um, the five way, in his book he wrote about these five different things which, which, are gonna, which, are, which could happen in terms of transition. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he said, which I think is heartening, is what, a, what another collapse could do. And I think what we need to remember is that things like Occupy, the ideas that Occupy generated, and the sentiment that the Arab Spring generated didn't just go away. Just because e, uh, CC came and then did a counter revolution and you know it's backed by the West. It doesn't mean that within Egypt those civil society movements that were born have simply disappeared. No, it's changed the direction of the struggle and it's intensified it, but it hasn't made it go away. And that's what's happened, I think, globally, is that a lot of these ideas are, are now in motion, they're fluid, these discussions are taking place, and we're now seeing that polarization, that struggle. You know, if, if you look in, in the end, the US is another good example, the massive polarization the polar, it's never been, politics has never been more polarised, where you've got an extreme far right, in, you know, which is now taking over the mainstream of the Republican Party, and then you've got the so-called extreme far left. I mean, now you've got the debates have become so, the debates are crazy now. It's the social justice warriors and the far left against the xenophobic Trump people. And it's just, it's like, that's, that's the way it is now. It's become really polarised. But I think that is a sign of the extent to which that kind of the struggle between um, the popular will is becoming real, and, and that that's that's really going to be a defining uh, kind of it's going to be a defining kind of uh, feature of the, the next decade is exactly how this crisis erupts and how communities respond to the uncertainties which those crises generate. Thank you. We've got time for one or two more questions. Who's going to follow? If, if no one's going to follow up, can I follow, come back? Yes, you can, Wayne. <laughs> yeah, um, I want to follow up with this, because uh, you're being a, quite a bit, uh, not quite West Ocentric, but I'll just give an example of where I, I think about it. The country I study is Bangladesh. Now, when you talk about forces with power and people with power, I mean, one of the most powerful people, or forces of people, are uh, studies. Who are, for example, oh, like so Saudi Arabia? Oh, yeah, yeah. Who, for example, you talk about creating the social will, uh, or the popular will, who, who finance madrasas. Because you've got a collapse of education, the state just basically can't run the schools. The vast majority of young people in Bangladesh, who, many of them illiterate, are raised in madrasas, uh, follow Wahhabism, which is not a culture of Islam that has anything to do with Bengal. Right, and they come up um, with a particular form of education structure, um, following a particular form of identity, um, if you like, politics, that is actually historically anti-Bengal. And their idea of the crisis of uh, Bangladesh is a crisis of Western intrusion through the neoliberal fact that Bangladesh has had this wonderful, by Bangladesh standards, um, growth rate over the last year, six, seven percent through the garment industry. And what that causes is hundreds of thousands of women to leave the villages and come into Dhaka and Chittagong and go to these huge garment factories, work sometimes in bad conditions, sometimes in poor conditions, sometimes unregulated, sometimes in very nice conditions. But they therefore leave the social control groups of the village, they're searching for new identities, the rising middle class is the, uh, has Facebook media, right? But this causes a, a feeling amongst the majority of people still live in rural areas that Bangladesh is now no, it's out of control. It's going to, and you have, I, well, I constantly feel, hear these conversations where people say, oh, Islam is under threat. We're under threat. But when you actually look at it and other people talk to them, it's actually not been Gauli Islam that's under threat. Because they, have, they are now imbibing an identity in Bangladesh which has nothing to do with Bengali Islam. It's, Saudi Arabian Wahhabism that's been imported through the power of running these madrasas and other things. So, I mean, there's, there's huge numbers of interceptions there. The, the, thinking, 
really working out who are the people of power. It's sometimes really difficult. In actual fact, the main political, Islamic political party in Bangladesh, the Jamaat al-Islam, runs three of the main banks. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated It's interesting situation. you mention that because, I mean, I'm Bangladeshi ethnically. Mm. Mm. So, you know, I think you're probably actually, you're probably more um, familiar from an academic and historical perspective. Because um, obviously I'm only familiar from my family and, you know, I've been so well, I, my, well, actually, my mum's my from Dhaka and my dad's from Chittagong. Right. So, um, but, but yeah, I'm def I mean, I totally hear what you're saying. Um, and in fact, that's exactly what I mean when I talk about the crisis of civilization. Mm -hmm. So whereas some, an idiot like Huntington might be like, well, it's the Saudis and it's them. You know, the Saudis are part of this Muslim mm -hmm. world, homogenized against the West or whatever. In reality, what we see is this much more complex phenomenon where fossil fuel funded um, extremism is being exported and the kind of uh, the openings that neoliberal crises can create in these countries like Bangladesh or Pakistan mm -hmm. then gives a space mm -hmm. for that funding to then create these grounds well and in fact I mean that's something which I'm actually very passionate about um, researching is, is the role of the Gulf states. Um, I mean, it's a completely other area of journalism that I haven't really mentioned today, which is the role of the Gulf states in quite deliberately and consciously financing um, Islamist militant groups, um, not just all over the world, but even you know, specifically in places like Iraq and Syria and Lebanon, and, and, and all, for geopolitical reasons, all kinds of different reasons, um, depending on where they're doing it. And the impact that that has had, the devastating impact that has locally and socially. Um, but what's interesting about that process is again, it's part of this, it's part of this wider fracturing that we're seeing taking place as part of this wider crisis, which is how this funding has now developed this kind of like these movements which are anti-Western, in some cases carrying out attacks. I mean, Bangladesh is basically, I mean, Bangladesh is like, I don't know what the hell's going to happen to Bangladesh because it's, the civil society is so fractured. Um, the only thing they know how to do is like, have street marches constantly and then there's people shooting in the streets all the time. My uncle um, is a, he was a professor, my late uncle, Professor Aftab Ahmed, I don't know if you know him, he used to be, um, he used to be a government advisor. Um, he was shot as part of the, um, you know, there's a spate of assassinations that are just going on. Like, nobody even really knows exactly who's doing it, why. Um, because of appearances. Yeah, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And the guy just came into his house and just shot him point blank. Um, that kind of, I mean, that kind of chaos which is unfolding is part of this, what I think is, this, is, is part of this broader system failure that we're seeing, mm. where there's so many complex things taking place. What's going to make it more interesting well, interesting is not the right word, but um, is the is this problems that Saudi Arabia is facing now? So Saudi Arabia is facing its own multiple problems, and this speaks to the the, the, the issue that I've said, where you have crisis and the reaction, and what happens when the reaction is, let's try and do more of what we're doing now because that's all we know. The Saudis got problems domestically in terms of their um, their huge revenue deficit. Um, their uh, oil, pro oil, oil production problems, which are, according to a lot of studies, in the next decade is going to be very, very difficult for Saudi Arabia. They can't keep maintaining the levels of production that they have. Um, so that's going to have an impact on the state. Mm -hmm. Similar to what's already happened in Syria, in Egypt, where we've seen what can happen when oil production declines, impacts on state revenues, and then decreases the power of the state to maintain territorial integrity. So Saudi's got a time bomb, it's sitting there on the time bomb. Um, and, but their answer to that is, let's go and bomb Yemen. <laughs> Somehow, this is gonna help us. I, I, I don't understand why they think bombing Yemen is gonna stave off their problems. But they really think this is the good thing, this is the, this is the, the, this is the right thing to do <clears throat> strategically. But that's part of the problem, is that when you're thinking about this without understanding really what is driving it. I mean, I don't know if they, do they even believe that they've got an oil crisis coming? I don't know, maybe they don't, maybe they don't believe it. Maybe it's not gonna happen. Maybe they've got faith in it, I don't know.
Thank you. Well, if there are no more oh, yes, is this a question? No, well, if there are no more questions, I can see people. Oh, sorry, Louise. Yeah, no, I'll back to your talk. I'd be really interested to just ask you about perhaps your personal intellectual trajectory vis-a-vis -vis the concept of genocide and how that's changed. And particularly, I'm thinking a lot of the, you know, the systemic uh, context that you're talking about really kind of resonate with the stream in the genocide studies literature, which is kind of looking at these intersections between genocide and um, colonialism. And to even go back to Raphael Lemkin's uh, you know, his early writings and his original definition of what is seen as being, having this, this deeply colonial logic. So in the context of, you know, all of the, the systemic issues you've been describing, do we need to rethink the, the concept of genocide itself, in particular kind of drawing in concepts of colonialism, neo-colonialism or imperialism, empire? I mean, how do you see that? Yeah, that's yeah, that's a really good question, and it's, it's close to my heart because I did my PhD on that. My whole PhD was about um, empire and genocide, and looking. I at... downloaded it actually. Oh really? Years <laughs> <laughs> ago. So yeah. Um, so yeah, so I mean, I think, I mean, the case I've argued there is that I think genocide does need to be reconceptualized, and I think Raphael Lemkin did set out a basis for that. Um, he yeah. did set out a, a, a conception of genocide which was drawn from the history of European colonialism which recognised that it was part of a, um, a, a kind of an, an imbalance in power. <coughs> and I think one of the, the thing that's really, um, I think, most important, which I found, which I was pushing up against, gen within genocide studies it was the, the reification of group identities. And you've got a group of scholars who are always saying, you know, you've got these fixed group identities, essentially, and then you stick them together and they start fighting and one side has a bit of power and they want to kill the other side or whatever. Um, you know, and, and it's a very kind of, um, I mean, I'm, I'm really oversimplifying it, I'm not doing them justice either. Um, but, it, but, I, but I think the other side is, is, is those genocide scholars who are focusing less on group identity as, oh, you know, there are certain religions or certain races or certain ethnicities, but there are fluid group identities which change. Um, and what I, what I argued was that um, it's in the, it's the colonial structure imposes conditions of crisis which have those different group identities colliding. And suddenly you need to now find ways to accommodate those. Yeah. And in some cases, and this is what I think can lead to different types of violence. So I think, for example, um, I mean, I was studying, um, I was comparing British colonization of the Americas with the Spanish colonization. Um, and what I found interesting was the variations in the different types of violence between the British and the Spanish, which were linked to, uh, I mean, obviously the, the, the British kind of exported the sort of proto-capitalist English settler mm -hmm. colonialism, whereas the Spanish were kind of more semi-feudal. Um, um, pre-capitalist and, and, and that was and there was a kind of a link there the type of violence that they were deploying um, and that was I think very much to do with the way in which they perceived the indigenous population so for the Spanish the indigenous population was um, a, labor, a labor source that could just be integrated into existing kind of relations of, of production where you kind of use them as slave labor and blah 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 it fit it flipped that kind of semi-feudal model that they were already using. Whereas, um, and, and, and it kind of also fit the, and that then fit the ideologies as well that they had, the Christian idea of kind of like evangelizing and converting them, the heathens, into, and making them join missionaries. Whereas the English were, they became more and more radicalized as it became clear that well, these guys are just dying out and they're crap at work and you know, we, they're not really useful. Let's just get rid of these guys. And literally it was like, just ethnically cleansed and expelled. Um, and it was coincided with this ideology which was very much about, you know, the Protestant, this Protestant ideology of, of, of Puritanism, you know, which was like, you know, we can't accept these guys and there's not really a place for them. They were a lot more exclusionary. Um, but what was, I mean, that was the general dynamic, but I think what was most Interesting was how specific crises at the time, like really specific crises, actually was what triggered 
for genocidal violence. It was never just this general thing. And sometimes you get that. Sometimes there's this sense of like, there are some scholars, if you read them, like maybe David Stannard in his American Holocaust, who's great, great work he did. Where, but it's just a very kind of like this sense of this machine which just unfolds. Whereas I think there are, I think like there are others, like Dirk Moses is really good. Um, but there, there's nothing more of a recognition which, that, that you have to look at the specific historical sociology of, of, of how crises led to conflictual relations, which radicalized the group identity formation, which made people think these people are, the en are now the enemy and we have to do something about them, otherwise we can't survive. Um, and sometimes, a lot of the times it was like, it was incidental things, you know, you had, you had the colonies facing up against problems with indigenous people who said, you know, you can't do this over this issue. There's something that seems seemingly random and it turns into a conflict and in the end um, there's an attack or a counter-attack and then it becomes this perception of, you know, these guys basically are a threat to the survival of the colony and we, that we need to um, eliminate them in some way. So I think that was, um, I think that's, that idea of how to kind of see how colonization produced those crises. So it wasn't something that was like an inevitable thing. Some people will say, oh, colonization inevitably produces genocide in a structural way, and I would disagree with that. I think we're going to have to wind up because I think there's a class waiting outside. But, um, but can I just say thank you all very much for coming. A tremendous talk, and is, uh, and a huge amount to think about. But I think that once people start making the interconnections that you've talked about and start sort of reducing them to something that, that unifies them, I think we will all be in a position to resist, as you suggest, Wayne. So thank you all very much, and thank you. All.